Welcome students to the second respiratory system lecture, this time focusing on respiratory physiology. Um, so to remind ourselves of the four respiratory processes, we have ventilation, which is breathing, the, the act of air moving into and out of our lungs. We then have external respiration, which is the exchange of oxygen and carbon dioxide between the circulatory system and the lungs. We have the transport of the gases by the circulatory system. And then we also have internal respiration, which is the exchange of oxygen and carbon dioxide between the blood and all of our body tissues. Um, and so we're going to go through all of the four respiratory processes, talk a little bit about how they work, and then we'll talk a little bit about how we assess um, kind of respiratory health. Um, so we're going to start with pulmonary ventilation. Um, and what I particularly like about studying ventilation is that you have a set of lungs, right? You have a body. Um, and so you can actually inhale and exhale, inspire and expire, um, and kind of feel what happens um, when you inhale and when you exhale. So it's, it's kind of, you know, when you get asked a question about it on the test, um, then you can actually do it right then and there and kind of figure out what's happening. Um, so it is two processes. It's the air moving kind of into the lungs, which is inhalation or inspiration, right, in, um, and then air moving out of the lungs, expiration or exhalation, exo meaning out. Um, and what I find particularly amazing about ventilation is honestly just how simple it is. So you would think, with something as important as getting oxygen into our body in order to have energy to do well anything, um, it'd be really complicated, right? It's anatomy and physiology, it's complicated. The body's super complicated. Except this, this is not complicated. Um, it's actually a really, really simple process, um, completely dependent on um, how pressure and volume are related. Um, so um, ventilation works on um, changes in the volume of the thoracic cavity, the volume of the lungs, um, leading then to pressure changes. And when pressure changes between two compartments, the gases will flow from one compartment to the other compartment until they have been equalized. Now, these pressure and volume relationship is based on a gas law called Boyle's Law. Um, and it's, it's the idea that the pressure and the volume are inversely related. So if you have a container um, filled with a gas, the gas will take up that whole container. If you then make that container smaller with the same amount of gas, the gas is then at a higher pressure. And so if the volume of a, cat, of a container or a cavity decreases, then the pressure of the gases inside that cavity will increase. And then vice versa, if you increase the size of a cavity or a container, then the pressure inside that container or cavity will go down. And that is it. That is how ventilation works, purely on that principle. So if we look at Inspiration first, um, this is the active process. Um, your muscles are actually contracting, um, leading to the kind of volume changes. Um, so the diaphragm contracts and flattens out, uh, kind of pulling the thoracic cavity down. The intercostal muscles then contract. Um, that lifts up your rib cage. So the, since the diaphragm flattens out, rib cage comes up, right? You inhale very deeply. You can kind of feel your lungs kind of filling up with air. Um, the volume um, of the lungs has increased. Um, since the volume has increased, the pressure then inside the lungs decreases, creates kind of a vacuum um, where the pressure inside the lungs, the intrapulmonary pressure, is less than kind of the surrounding atmospheric pressure. And so air flows out of the atmosphere into the lungs until the pressures have equalized. Then we have expiration or exhalation, which is actually a passive process driven uh, largely by the kind of very elastic nature of the lungs and the fact that they can recoil really well. Um, so in this instance, the diaphragm and intercostal muscles will relax. When the diaphragm relaxes, it re goes back to this dome shape. And when the intercostals relax, the rib cage then lowers down. This decreases the volume of the thoracic cavity, decreases the volume of the lungs. Since the volume is decreasing, 
the pressure then increases to the point where it is higher than atmospheric pressure. And so again, the gases flow kind of down the pressure gradients um, until the pressures are equalized. And so air flows out of the lungs and into the external environment. Um, and we have some nice model lungs in the lab for you guys um, to use to kind of demonstrate uh, the mechanics of um, the, the respiratory kind of ventilation process here. You can also look at um, respiratory sounds. So you'll use some stethoscopes again um, to listen to respiratory sounds. Um, respiratory sounds tend to fall into one of two categories, what we call bronchial sounds, which are more of those kind of whooshing, kind of rushing kind of sounds as air is moving through the trachea and the bronchi. And then we also have what we call vesicular sounds, which is the air um, kind of moving into the alveoli. And because those passageways are much smaller, it's more like a, like a rustling sound, like, like we like leaves kind of being blown by the wind um, and so you can actually um, hear a difference um, once you've once you've had a little practice the next two respiratory processes are external and internal respiration um, and they are driven by the fact that gases will diffuse kind of down a partial pressure or concentration gradient. So they're going to go from the area of high pressure or concentration to the area of low pressure or concentration. And so in external respiration, this is the exchange of gases that's taking place in the lungs. So we're talking pulmonary circuit, right? So oxygen is moving out that we just inhaled is moving out of the alveoli and into the blood of the circulatory system, carbon dioxide, um, which came from our body tissues, carried in the blood, is moving out of the blood into the alveoli so it can move up the respiratory tract and be exhaled out of the body. Internal respiration involves the systemic circuit, so it's the exchange of oxygen and carbon dioxide at all of our body tissues. So oxygen is moving from the blood into all the body tissues, so the body tissues can use the oxygen. Um, and then the carbon dioxide, which was a waste product, moves out of those body tissues and into the blood in order to return to the lungs in order for it to be excreted and gotten rid of. Um, so of course, for oxygen to move from the lungs, um, to get to the body tissues and for carbon dioxide to go from the body tissues to the lungs, it has to be transported through our circulatory system. Um, so oxygen um, is um, transported primarily through hemoglobin, right? And attaches to the kind of iron atom in the heme groups on the hemoglobin on our red blood cells. Um, and carbon dioxide um, is transported mostly dissolved um, in the blood plasma as what we call bicarbonate ions. Um, although some carbon dioxide will actually attach to kind of the, the proteinaceous kind of globular part of hemoglobin on the red blood cells. So a very small portion of carbon dioxide actually travels on the red blood cells as well. So if we kind of look at that kind of in summary, um, we have ventilation, which is air moving into the alveoli, and then we have external respiration. So higher concentration of oxygen here, lower concentration of oxygen here, and so oxygen moves out of the alveoli and into the lungs. It is then transported back to the heart, um, traveling again, attached primarily to hemoglobin, the heart then pumps it out the aorta through the systemic circuit out to all of the body tissues where oxygen then goes through internal respiration, moving out of the blood and into all of our body cells. Chromo dioxide has kind of the opposite path, right? It's made out here in our body cells as a waste product. So carbon dioxide goes through internal respiration first, moving out of the tissues and into the blood because it's higher pressure here, lower pressure here. It is then transported back to the heart through the venous blood, um, primarily dissolved as bicarbonate, uh, although a little bit attached to hemoglobin and an even smaller bit actually just dissolved directly in the blood plasma. Um, it then is externally respired, moving out of the blood into the alveoli, up the respiratory tract, and exhaled and gotten rid of. 
Um, so those are our four respiratory processes. The other thing you're going to get a chance to do in lab is what we call spirometry. And so these are two versions of a spirometer. You have a wet spirometer here, a dry spirometer here, this little handheld one. Um, and essentially what this does is it measures different respiratory volumes. Um, we can look at lung health. Like, are you able to inhale a lot? Are you able to exhale a lot? How much air is filling your lungs. Um, so the wet spirometers, um, you, you basically breathe into the tube, um, it's filled with water, hence wet spirometer, and as you breathe into the tube, um, air fills up under this kind of bell, and that then moves the indicator. On the handheld dry spirometers, you breathe into and exhale into the spirometer, and it moves the little needle so that you can read the respiratory volume. Um, so we're going to go through a couple of the respiratory volumes that um, you should be able to um, answer some questions about. Starting with what we call a tidal volume, and a tidal volume is like a normal breath. A normal inhale, normal exhale, just completely unforced, relaxed. Um, it's about half a liter, 500 milliliters or so, um, but no, no forcing of it. We then have two uh, reserve volumes. You have an expiratory reserve and an inspiratory reserve. The expiratory reserve is the volume of ale that you can forcibly exhale after you have taken a normal tidal breath. Um, so you breathe out normally and then try to force more air out. How much more air can you get out? The inspiratory reserve is how much air you can forcibly inhale after a normal respiration. So you take a normal inhale and then try to see how much you can then kind of forcibly inhale beyond that point. Um, we then have what we call vital capacity, which is literally the entire total amount of air that you can exchange with your, uh, between your lungs and the environment. So that includes the tidal volume, the normal breath, plus the two reserve volumes, the expiratory reserve and the inspiratory reserve. It's the total exchangeable amount of air. Uh, because actually, not all of the air in your lungs is exchangeable with the environment. Sometimes there's clogs, sometimes alveoli collapse, and so there's always a small what we call residual volume, um, this little bit of air that remains in the lungs even after kind of a maximal effort. Um, if you take that residual volume and add it to the vital capacity, the amount, the, the amount of exchangeable air plus the amount of air that remains, you get a total lung capacity, um, which for most of us, especially men, a little bit less than women, is about 6,000 milliliters. So let's take a nice look at the figure. So you can see here is your tidal volume, right? Nice, normal 500 milliliter breath. You can see here is your expiratory reserve. How much extra can you exhale? Here is your inspiratory reserve. How much extra can you inhale? Um, that then gives you your vital capacity. How much of the air inside your lungs can you exchange with the environment? Leaving a little bit in terms of the residual volume. And if you add the vital capacity, plus the residual volume, you get your total lung capacity. Um, and if any one of these is off, too big, too small, um, it usually then indicates that there's some problem perhaps. Uh, maybe you're a smoker. Um, maybe you're super athletic. Um, that's not a problem per se, but it's something kind of outside the ordinary. Um, and all of those different things will affect um, these different lung volumes. Your age affects it, uh, your height, um, kind of your total body size. Um, so there are a couple of different things that can affect these different respiratory volumes. Uh, but you'll get a chance actually in lab to um, assess your lung health, or at least the lung health of a volunteer from your group. Um, and that is the end of exercise 37.